Uh, a big thank you to our sponsors, Armanino and uh, 1227 Coaching. We couldn't do this without all of you. If you are uh, joining us, please mute out uh, or Gigi will mute you as well. Is there anyone from Armanino on the call to say a quick hello? Maybe not joined us yet. They usually come on and if, if they do, please raise your hand and we will um, allow you to give a little spiel to the group. But again, please open the feedback form, provide feedback during the pitches. And this is who we're going to talk to today. So we've got six incredible founders, super diverse in terms of their product or service offering, in terms of their background and expertise. Um, so hopefully you'll be able to join us for all six pitches. The format is 10 minutes of pitch, 10 minutes of feedback. I will open up the floor for you all to at least un maybe unmute if you'd like to, or you can add it in the chat and then I will address the questions live with the founder. So the goal here is to, um, again, pro provide feedback, make sure your questions are answered. So this can be a super fun and effective conversation. Um, Gigi, did I miss anything? Are we good? Do I get a gold star from you? Gold star. I'm excited. Gold to star. Get awesome. Awesome. Um, all right. Uh, for those of you who are pitching, there will be a timer should be in the upper right hand corner. So as that runs down, I will let you know when your time is up and then we will go into Q and a. All right. Um, yeah. All right. So do we have, uh, Amantha, Amantha, are you in the room? I see you. I am. And I do want to apologize, Laurel. You got to see me pitch a peak performance, but I am recovering from COVID. Oh no! Yeah, well, so well, mostly there. I'm like 95, percent but sometimes I get a little bit hung up on the words. I think most of us have been there for sure. But uh, for those of you who have not seen Amantha pitch before, she's a freaking rock star. You won one of the Women Founder Networks checks, right? You got the grand prize. Awesome! Uh, so this will be my second time seeing her, and I think you are just a game changer in the um, in the industry. So with that, I will pass it along to you to share your screen and take it away. Awesome. All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Amantha. I am a pharmacy technician turned founder and CEO of RX Post, where we help pharmacies sell their unused drugs to other pharmacies. I know, right? You've probably never thought about what happens to all those unused medications sitting behind the pharmacy counter after they expire. I think about it all the time. It's not because I'm obsessed with drugs, but after nearly two decades of working behind pharmacy counters, I've seen perfectly good medications go into waste, while at the same time, patients are struggling to find the medications they need. Our industry wastes a devastating $40 billion globally each year. And this isn't just a number. This represents your parent's heart medication, someone's insulin, a child's asthma inhaler. And so one pharmacy's waste is another pharmacy's ozempic. And that's a real example of medication we've sold on our platform. So think of us as a matchmaking service, helping pharmacies turn potential losses into revenue while ensuring medications make it into the hands of patients that need them. And now imagine a system where we know all the inventory of all the pharmacies and health systems everywhere. And we know all the dispensing behaviors of all these pharmacies. That would really put our matchmaking service on steroids. And that's exactly what we're working towards. We started small, just in California, building relationships door to door. And today we've saved hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of medications from being wasted, while at the same time generating revenue for both us and our customers. But what really excites me is our expansion potential. We are negotiating contract terms with a titan of industry with access to over 50,000 pharmacies and 80% of US hospitals. We're also finalizing talks with a buying group that represents over 450 pharmacies on the East Coast, where we're currently working on getting licensed. And we also have a signed LOI with a drug manufacturer for direct to pharmacy sales. These partnerships will help us 15X our revenue in the next 18 months. And we're starting with independent pharmacies because it's easy to get to the decision makers. They make up 35% of all retail pharmacies and represent a whopping $94 billion market segment. They are the economic and healthcare engines 
across community in communities across the country. But we're completely reshaping the dr drug supply chain. Just today, we had a conversation with a drug manufacturer to open up one medication to one hospital client, which would represent a $30 million contract per month. The time is finally right to tackle this multi-billion dollar opportunity in pharmacy. I'm on the board of two local pharmacist associations, the Policy Committee for the California Pharmacist Association, and I'm a delegate to the American Pharmacist Association, ensuring that Rx Post is not only a business, but a mission-driven solution for the entire healthcare ecosystem. We have an amazing group of advisors supporting us and have successfully completed several accelerators and angel fundraising. So now we're raising $1.9 million to take our solution across the country, reaching pharmacies in all 50 states and ensuring that our solution works seamlessly within existing pharmacy workflows. This will help us deliver value faster to our pharmacies so we can get back to what they love doing most, helping you. Thank you. Amazing. With time to spare. I love it. Yep. Um, I see that you added some new content here based on the conversations the last time around. So that's been super helpful. If you could unshare your screen, please, so we can look at your pretty face and have some questions directly. Um, if anyone has a question from the audience, please raise your hand and or add it in the chat um, so that we can integrate your questions. Otherwise, I've got questions, but I want to make sure that this is a collective conversation as well. So does anyone have questions? Uh, Julie, I saw that you unmuted. Go for it. Um, that is amazing. That's wonderful. I have a million questions, but I'll just stick to one or two. So is this, how is this, how do you find out who is participating in this network? So we're building our pharmacy chain. So we our, our pharmacy network. We have over 250 pharmacies here in California where we are currently licensed. And we're expanding our network out into other states across the U.S. because of our strategic partnerships. Okay, so it's right now you're just in California. Are there certain states that you have work in progress, like, you know, that's going to be down the pipeline? Because I have an elderly mother and friends in Oregon and around, you know, we all do. And expansion plan looks like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so New York is actually in the immediate pipeline with Texas, Florida, uh, close to follow, and then Pennsylvania and Ohio because of some of my pharmacy relationships there um, and, and also based on density. I think it's important to note that we are business to business, so we're facilitating excess inventory between pharmacies so that the end pharmacy gets to continue to be the hero to their patients. Awesome. Thanks, Julie. Anyone else have any questions that they'd like to ask? Otherwise, I'll get into mine. I've got a lot of questions. You guys are just warming up, huh? All right. Get ready for the holiday season. I understand. Um, Amantha, how important are the, you have all, you sit on these, all these boards uh, and associations. How important are those relationships to this model for you? You mentioned it a lot in the last time I heard you pitch. Has that been kind of like a foothold with getting into these organizations or into these uh, smaller pharmacies? Yeah, I think definitely being able to to rely on our own reputation because of building trust and advocacy um, with the policy that we work at the locals that we do at the local, state, and national levels. But also, it brings those larger strategic partners to us so that they can rely on us to focus on what's best for the industry and not necessarily just corporate profits in a space that's highly regulated. Not saying profits are bad, but they have to be responsible profits. Absolutely. Uh, that was actually my next question, which is about the regulatory issues state by state. Um, how different are they and how are you planning to overcome them? Yep. So day one of completing this fundraise is a big check goes to a compliance company to go get his license in uh, all 50 states. So the process is about two to three months, depending on each process, but there is so much benefit to having our core license here in California because it is the most regulated state. Uh, so you said two months per state. It takes two to three months application process, sometimes shorter. That's, that's the padding that we're putting. And what is the actual license that you're receiving? 
So we have a wholesale license because we're brokering transactions between pharmacies, which actually helps facilitate our next transition into reshaping the drug supply chain. So one of the reasons that we had the conversation today about facilitating that one medication from the one drug manufacturer to the one hospital is because of our license within the state. It is so valuable. I can totally see that. Yeah. It's, I mean, a $30 million, $30 million yeah. on one uh, medication uh, is incredible. Um, is there any concern? Cause I know in like retail, for example, they've gone to like a on-demand model for a lot of um, production. Is there any concern that the drug industries will eventually, I mean, they're pretty stale and they're pretty slow, but is there any concern that they will ramp to more of an on-demand approach that might negate the need for something like this? I think there's always going to be a place for a brick and mortar pharmacy. And even Walgreens had admitted to, to this um, dual approach. To how do you deliver telehealth direct to the patients for the people that can benefit? But there's a large subset of the population that might not be tech savvy or have access to technology the way that we do, or just generally enjoys and trusts going into their local pharmacy where their pharmacist knows all their their medication regimens, but also knows them as a person. So if they're having an off day, you know, they can inquire into those things. These are just things that you can't capture with um, telehealth. That being said, we are positioning ourselves to be part of that shift. How do we connect manufacturers, the people who are making the medications, more efficiently to the people who need them? And does that cater to the patient in the future? Maybe. Does that can cater to the pharmacy that then does that last mile delivery or at the last mile that the final consultation with the patient when they come in? A great answer. Um, CVS has recently been in the news quite a bit in terms of closing their stores. Um, they're obviously on the big box retail side. Has that been a positive or a negative in terms of small pharmacies? And how do you see that impacting your business? If I thought about it. It's a positive for community pharmacy. So one in four neighborhoods in the U.S. actually operates in a pharmacy desert where people don't have access to um, a pharmacy, let alone like a physician, because there is a physician shortage. So what CVS has recognized is pharmacies are these access points for kind of these primary care services. Think of COVID. You could go to the pharmacy, have the pharmacist test you. And if you're positive, the pharmacist treats you. They actually write the prescription. And there's a shift across the whole U.S. where pharmacists can actually practice at the top of their license and perform some of these really acute services. You know, if if you have a you know your elderly grandmother who has you know been diabetic for the last 10, 15 years, and she can't make it into her physician's office for that annual visit, and they refuse to refill her medication. Well, she can go to the, pharmacy, the pharmacist, have them check vitals, and have them renew it for another 12 months. And that's where the landscape is shifting to. And what so, about, oh, go ahead. Do you have something else I'm add? sorry. I, well, my mind's going, this is Julie. I was just thinking hey, Julie. that, that you know, my, my parents live in a little town in Oregon, in Winston, and the closest town is 10 to 15 minutes away. They used to have Bymart that had pharmacy in it. It was awesome. Now that Bymart took away the pharmacy and there's one, to my knowledge, one pharmacy here in Winston. Otherwise, my elderly mom has to get in the car and drive, you know, 15 Julie, do you have a question miles. for Amantha? I want to make sure we're moving quickly. Oh, we only I'm sorry. Yes. So are you looking at rural places for people or elderly that where big places have closed the doors and now there's just one single self-owned yeah, pharmacy That was kind of the conversation you're having around CVS. Thanks, Julie. Yeah, I mean, yeah, and we see, we see these like service-based pharmacies popping up in those rural areas now that there's less competition because CVS are, is leaving these pharmacy deserts and we're positioning ourselves as the inventory management software supplier, the connector, so that they can focus on running their businesses while we take care of all their admin back, back office tasks. Yeah, it's a great answer. Um, I think we have two minutes left. So if anyone else has questions, please add them in the chat. Otherwise I wanna get through the ones that I have here. 
Um, Amazon has recently, not so recently, come into the pharmacy space. Is there an opportunity in terms of partnership there? I know that's where I get my drugs from. It's incredible. It's like next day and the price points are really competitive. Is that a market that you're interested in in touching or is that a com competitor in your perspective? I think what makes our business model really unique is that we have the opportunity to collaborate with a lot of these, these pharmacies. So where Amazon can't fulfill um, the need for same day delivery, can they partner with community pharmacies, you know, like Bymart, if they still had one, to provide these same benefits of cost savings at the pharmacy level? That's a great answer. Last question is, um, what does the sales cycle typically look like? I know in your roadmap, you are going to hire a couple of salespeople because right now it's kind of been like a one-to-one -one in terms of onboarding these smaller pharmacies. What does that sales cycle typically look like? Yeah. Um, so it has been very one-to-one -one relationship built. But now we're at the inflection point where we have the strategic partners coming to us. So in the pharmacy industry, I think what makes it a little bit more unique is there's buying groups that represent hundreds or thousands of pharmacies at a time. And because of our integrity and our relationships, we can leverage those to, for co-marketing opportunities as we expand to move away from this door-to-door -door process and have more inbound. I love it. Amantha, thank you so much. I think this is a fascinating strategy and I really appreciate you being first on the pitch block. It's always a little challenging, but, and and thank you for uh, obviously not being at your top peak health-wise. You did great. So we couldn't have told, we, you shouldn't have said anything. We wouldn't have known any better. Um, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, do we have Camila in the audience? Is Camila there with us? From AI Link. Camila, are you with us? If you are, please unmute. Otherwise, we can uh, put you down in the later stages. Gigi, do you see her? No, I think we can um, move um, to Ariana if not. Perfect. Um, again, as a reminder, like I can ask all these questions and I've got a ton of conversations that I am going to be having with these founders post this call, but I'm sure you are all curious. These are fascinating and very differentiated companies. So as a reminder, please add your questions in the chat. Uh, Julie, thank you for speaking up. We appreciate you engaging. This is about you guys and these founders, not about me and the fund right now. So please engage, ask questions, be a part of the conversation. Ariana, I see you unmuted. The floor is yours. And thanks for jumping in early. Yeah, of course. Let me just share my screen really quickly. Um, and going after Amantha is going to be, uh, <laughs> it's going to be fun. That was an awesome pitch. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Mariana Rodriguez. I'm an entrepreneur with ADHD and the founder of, and CEO of Corksley. So I've spent over 10 years working in operations, the last four and a half of which I ran my own operational consultancy, helping small businesses streamline their processes. And I have a confession. I hate project management, like deep burning hatred, like how the Grinch hates Christmas kind of hate, right? So here's how every new project goes for me. I get really excited. I sit down at my desk and then bam, I'm hit with this insanely overwhelming process that first I have to figure out what the actual tasks are that need to get done. Then I have to decide the order. Then I have to prioritize them, set up timelines, color code everything, and yes, the color coding is essential here. And then by the time I've done all of that, I've burned through the very energy that I needed to actually get started on my work. So it's like trying to put together one of those thousand piece jigsaw puzzles that gets dumped on the table, except half the pieces are upside down. Some are missing and oh, your dog may have eaten one. That's my brain and current project management tools expect me to kind of figure out all the pieces and map them out in a perfect plan. But I can't do that. And I know that if I feel this way after working in operations for 10 years, that so I know so many others are struggling with this too. So the truth is traditional project management tools are not designed or designed for linear thinkers. They expect everyone's brain to work like a checklist. A leads to B, B leads to C, et cetera. But for neurodivergent folks, it's more like a zebra sparkly thing down here. Oh, look, B. It's a beautiful chaos, but these tools demand a certain level of order before we can even get started. 
So when you're breaking down a project, prioritizing tasks, managing timelines, it's not intuitive. And instead of helping these project management tools pile on additional cognitive load, leaving many of us burned out before we even get a chance to do the actual work. And this is not just a neurodivergent problem. Many small business owners, who many of which are also neurodivergent, freelancers or solopreneur also feel the same way. They're juggling a million priorities and trying to stay organized with tools that don't really fit their need. So let's put this into a bit of perspective. 20% of the global population is neurodivergent, including individuals with ADHD, autism, and dyslexia. And among Gen Z, nearly 50% identify as neurodivergent. This is a massive and growing demographic. And it's not just about the numbers, right? So this gap is leading to frustration. This gap in how we're thinking and working is leading to frustration, burnout, and missed opportunities for both the individuals and businesses, which is why we've created Quarksly, a project management platform designed to work with your brain and not against it. So remember that zebra sparkly jigsaw puzzle I mentioned earlier? Quarksly takes that chaos and makes sense out of it. Our platform uses voice to task AI to transform your scattered thoughts into clear, actionable project plans. So here's how it works. Instead of opening up a blank screen like you would in Asana or Notion and feeling immediately overwhelmed about where to start, you just talk. That's it. You describe your product, you share your ideas, and outline what you want to get done. And Corksly listens. It organizes those thoughts into tasks, prioritizes them, and even sets up the timelines for you. So we're addressing two critical pain points here, reducing cognitive load by eliminating the upfront effort and manual organizing that you need to do and fostering intuitive work, right? We meet you where you are, working with your natural rhythms to support productivity without added burnout. And while the voice to task, this is just like a little demo of the AI, but while the voice to task is our standout feature, it's not our only one. We also offer risk alerts to flag tasks that you yourself personally are at risk of slipping through the cracks. We give you your most productive times and dates. We have a really user-friendly interface designed to minimize cognitive overwhelm. And on the roadmap, we have future integrations with tools like Slack and Gmail, which will help improve and up a seamless workflow. So Quarksy really is more than just a tool. We're building a productivity system that empowers how people work and makes it feel much more intuitive and flexible. So the team, who are we? So like I said at the beginning, I bring about a decade of operations experience and have lived the struggles that we're trying to solve when it comes to neurodivergent entrepreneurship, neurodivergent workers. Um, and I've also been on the quest. Yes, I set a quest of trying to build the perfect uh, tool or system to keep myself organized. So it started with gel pens in the 90s and has taken me through every single custom planner that was out in the early 2000s and then eventually through all the software that you can only imagine. And Corksy really is a culmination of that journey, taking the learnings that are taken from each of those tools into one tool. And then our CTO Vivek Ranjan is also neurodivergent, so he really understands where, who our people are and has 12 years of experience in tech leadership, including scaling uh, fast bridge learning to 20 million ARR before its acquisition and uh, building and being the co-founder of WAC, a social media platform that reached thousands of daily users before they um, before it was also sold. So our traction, we're currently in beta with 16 small uh, business owners, including six paying customers, ranging from everything from solopreneurs to restaurateurs. And the feedback has been really positive so far. A couple of users have said that this is the first tool that doesn't make them feel overwhelmed um, and then shared how it requires very little of a learning curve to really feel like you're doing, you're getting things done in the tool. We also have grown a wait list of over 250 potential users entirely organically. And every time we talk to somebody about Quarksly, the excitement is really palpable. People have told me that they wish that this existed years ago and that, or this is exactly what they've been looking for. And while I get that excitement doesn't equal dollars, it's a clear signal that we're resonating with a deeply underserved market. We're addressing a $4.2 billion project management software market that's expected to grow to $6 billion by 2027. 
And again, we're reaching out and trying to tackle 20% of the population. So even if we make what we um, hit 1% of our of this TAM, we will be doing very well. Um, so Corksley operates in a crowded space. It is a productivity tool and we get that. However, unlike tools like ClickUp, Asana or Notion, Corksley is built from the ground up for neurodivergent users. This, the traditional tools, like I mentioned before, are really rigid, linear, and demand a lot of organization before you even get started. That's why larger organizations have entire operations departments. They have entire departments focused on managing projects because of the amount of cognitive load that these kind of tools require. We, again, take a very different approach, uh, really focusing on this voice to task and flexibility to make it easier to run to do your work. And while there are other ADHD friendly apps like Sinsama and Motion, these are only task management platforms that don't allow for the true collaboration that you need on teams, right? They're not actual project management platforms. So to scale Corksley and to fully capitalize on this opportunity, we're raising 1.5 million. Uh, this funding will give us a two year runway to expand our user base to 2000 subscribers continue to build out our features, including task integration um, and enhanced productivity profiling, and to grow our team to support product development and customer success. Um, and while our break even point is at about 3000 users, which we aim to reach within the first three years, this investment can help, uh, will help, sorry, this investment, with this investment, we can build a product that transforms how neurodivergent professionals and small business owners approach productivity. So thank you for your time. And at Corksley, we're not just building software, we're, re we're rethinking productivity for millions um, that have been left behind by traditional tools. tools. So interesting. Thank you. Uh, great job. Um, as someone whose team uses um, ClickUp, we understand the issues here and the challenges. <laughs> Uh, so if this really works, which it sounds like it does, it's fascinating. Uh, it looks like Amantha, you had a question. Go ahead. I do have two questions. Um, one, how does it know that the task is done? Um, and then two, like the marketing spend, like what is the marketing strategy? So right now, the, like every other project management tool, you would click the little check mark, um, and it gives you like a full check mark with a full, like cross out, which I think is very satisfying. Yes, these little micro things are very important to me. Um, and so that's how it knows that the task is done. I mean, can you lie to Corksley and tell it like, no, it, uh, can you lie to Corksley? Sure, right? Like, like you would in a click up, you can lie to it and tell it it's done and it's not really done. But that's how it knows it's done. Right now, our marketing spread is zero. We're really working on a community based approach where we're like talk, reaching out to people that we know are go to market is like reaching out to my personal network that I've cultivated over the last five years as a consultant, um, many of which are neurodivergent. And we're looking to kind of see where we go with that. We haven't done any ad spend. We're not looking to do much ad spend. We're really looking to do this organically as much as possible, uh, partner with some strategic companies, some other companies who are aligned working with the neurodivergent people, but maybe in a slightly different avenue. Um, I would love to work with like the SHRM with companies like uh, that do EAP, like that kind of stuff to kind of help improve productivity, burnout, et cetera, for people in small businesses. That's a great answer. I would add to that, if you could show a little bit more on the roadmap from a marketing perspective, because you are saying you're at, you have 150 in the wait list and uh, I don't remember maybe a dozen that are actually testing right now, mm -hmm. but that roadmap to 3000 users to profitability is pretty vast. So I think that was okay. probably one of the reasons why Amantha brought the question up and within the slide, be helpful to see kind of what that trajectory looks like. Maybe that you have a couple of those really deep relationships so that uh, we understand how you can land and expand uh, those. Um, thank Amazing. you for that question, Amantha. Shroot, looks like you had a question. Go ahead and unmute. Yes, um, I am also a neurodivergent founder and I am 
like everybody else, you mentioned thrilled at the idea of this. Um, but I was wondering, out of the beta testers that you have, um, what is retention looking like? Um, and what is kind of the experience? Because, you know, neurodivergent people, we love to try something new. And then it's like a new toy. And then what does it look like to actually be able to stick um, and have lasting power with this program? Yeah, I just had this conversation this morning. Um, so right now we're at on any given day, we have about 10 out of the 16 users on the tool. Um, and they are probably on it for a couple of hours a day, up and down a couple minutes here and there. The tool really is uh, built so that you can literally do everything from just the homepage without having to do much digging around. Um, so obviously most people are spending time on the homepage. Um, the goal with this, with the understanding that the neurodivergent brain likes to pick things up and put things down, is that we're adding additional features here to make it easy to pick it back up. Right. So like if we're thinking about the click up, the notion, the sign on the Trello, we have to you come back, you put it down. Right. You come back to it. You have 50 un overdue tasks. You have a thousand notifications. Everything is very overwhelming. And you're like, ah, never mind the fire. Like you're the little dog with the fire meme. Um, this really ideally, we're, well, not ideally, we're building a button, what I'm lovingly calling the potato button that on those days that you have to put it down and you can't do the work for whatever reason, you come back, you press this button and things automatically get rescheduled, taking into consideration your working hours, taking into consideration your current load. Um, and that's currently what the AI is doing is already taking into consideration your calendar, your meetings, your current project task loads. Um, we just have to build the button to automatically reschedule the things. Good right. Question. So like with these kinds of things and a little bit more love than most traditional project management tools, we're hoping to kind of keep up retention, even with the neurodivergent kind of pattern. Great answer, Ariana. Thank you. Uh, Morgan, looks like you've got a question. Go ahead and unmute. I'm so glad you guys are getting into this now. You're awake <laughs> finally. <laughs> so as another ADHD uh, person who does my entire project management doing voice to text notes in Otter and then asking it to try to turn it into exactly this, I'm so excited about what you're doing. Yay! Um, but uh, so just curious, like, as you're saying, you've got the um, integrations with uh, Gmail, and I know you said one other. Do you have any plans to uh, also include the Microsoft suite in there? And then also, what are those integrations looking like and allowing your users to do? So eventually, yes. So right now we have Google Calendar. Apparently integrating with Google Drive and Gmail is a whole other process that Gmail's making us go through. Um, so we have Google Calendar. It's not touching your actual calendar. What it's doing is leveraging that integration to be able to read your calendar, understand the meetings that you have and understand your capacity. You input your working hours into the tool itself and then it's able to help uh, with the prioritization, with the breakdowns, with the, the due date settings. Um, we are in the process of getting Google Docs and Gmail integrated into the thing as well. And then we are working on getting Zapier. So like, even if we can't natively get um, Microsoft integrated, we'll be able to do so with something like a Zapier, at least in the interim. But the hope is that we will be able to get like Zapier, Superhuman, right? All the, all the big ones in there soon. Yeah, the integrations are going to be huge. Great question, Morgan. Um, any other questions before I get into mine? Any other hands raised? We also have some notes in the chat. Uh, two ADH found D founders here love to see this. So people are super excited about it, Ariane. <laughs> I think that's what you've been noticing is like people are like, oh my God, I need this. Mm -hmm. um, so you mentioned that 20% of workers today are neurodivergent. Mm -hmm. um, of those, how many are using the platforms or using project management tools? I think that that would be an interesting or an important drill down because you could say, you know, the world is neurodivergent, but how many people are actually in need of a tool like this? I've tried to look at the numbers up, down, and sideways. I haven't been able to find a great stat to show me that specifically. Um, part of it is that people are just getting diagnosed. Part of it is that we can't tell what people's jobs are or if they have to use a project management tool unless it says project manager in their title, right? Um, I don't have a great stat on that. I've done, I've done a fair amount of digging though to try to find something. Um, this is really targeted towards Gen Z and I would assume Gen Alpha after that. 
but a lot of the purchasing power within these markets are from oldies like me. <laughs> I'm the old in the room in my team. So how uh, is the messaging going to be targeting, you know, the consumer or the buyer rather mm -hmm. while then serving the end user in the most effective way? So there's a couple different ways that we can do this. It is a really easy uh, interface, right? It's a very straightforward interface. So one, for people who are not necessarily tech savvy, it requires very little lift. I have no videos walking people through how to do anything on this tool. And everyone's figured it out very, very easily. And some of the people on here are in their 50s. So I it's so that in and of itself makes it gives us another market people who are just not tech savvy i need something simple um so that's part of the conversation and hopefully also with the very bottoms up in organizations so the more people that are using it in the organization hopefully that then will lead us to bigger conversations so the hope is that the divergent folks who learn about this tool float it up to the the buyer exactly. the c-suite and mm -hmm. and not force them but you know hope that they will then purchase purchase it. Yes. Um, that makes sense. You said you had a wait list of about 150 folks. Um, yes. What is the wait on the wait list? Why aren't you integrating these folks? Because we are still, so the feedback has been great, but we still are having some bugs with the AI. I'm waiting for the AI to kind of, I know that we have one shot with this wait list, right? I want to make sure that everything's as good as possible before these people are thrown in. I think that's absolutely fair. I was just uh, curious as to why you're mm -hmm. holding it today. Um, you had some uh, some users currently. They seem to be smaller users. Um, do you have any larger agencies uh, or companies that are using this platform yet? Because a, a case study uh, mm -hmm. for someone like me would be super helpful on, on, on that scale. So we have everything from the solopreneur to uh, somebody who owns like three restaurants. Um, so we ha do have like small teams to larger teams on here. Yes. Uh, I'd love to see maybe... I don't know if you can um, quantify it, but like how this has impacted, not just from a qualitative perspective, because I did see the quotes on like how people feel, but if yeah. there's a way to quantify the results of that in terms of efficiencies, I think mm -hmm. that would be a really impactful selling point. Will do. Awesome. Um, thank you so much. Time is up. That was thank so you. interesting. And as someone who uh, uses those platforms and has a team that uses those platforms and is young as well, I can really appreciate what you're, what you're building here, Ariana. Thank you so much. Um, next up, I think Camila did join us. Camila, are you in the room? Okay, uh, great. There you go. Awesome. Take it away. Wonderful. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about Rita Health. Rita is the fertility predictive tool that I will tell you how is going to really rethink fertility system as such. I'm the co-founder and the CEO. And... Before I jump into the solution, I want to remind you about the status quo. Women delay, delay motherhood, and it's a fact that it's not only present in our highly educated, well dropped society, it's for everyone. More women give birth after 30 year old for their first child than before. Women who are becoming moms are way closer to 40 year old than 20 year old which then it's very much connected to the fact that our biological clock is ticking and fertility issues are kicking in at scale. Today, 20% of women are already reporting fertility issues. Not every fertility issue is equal infertility, but the scale of problems shows. By now, the market of infertility cost $9 million. It's predicted to go to 17 million in 2028. On scale, there are 15 million women in, US, in the US every year thinking about becoming moms in the next five years. If you think about who they can speak with, we have 21,000 OBGYNs and we have 1.3 thousand of fertility specialists. The healthcare system, however, allows you to talk to fertility specialists after you are trying to get pregnant. If you want to raise questions, when should I uh, do it? What's the my, uh, what's my option? What's my situ situation? They will tell you, we have nothing for you unless you've been unsuccessful. And then who suffers? We. On our deck, it's Amelia. I'm sure that in this group, there's going to be other women who can identify with those questions. You have sisters, brothers, spouses, employees that would be very familiar with that. How much time do I have? Can I have it all? Can I have a career and a family together? How do I do it? 
when we scan the market, by the way, my background is I'm a mechanical engineer. I studied in Poland originally. I'm Polish. I did my master's degrees in Cambridge. Then I work at Google and Google X in life science innovation. And I worked as a VP of product for Flow Health. Today, Flow is the biggest period tracker in the world. I joined them to help close B round and nobody, literally nobody believed that period tracker can become a monetizable category. The, the check, I can disclose it because the safe space was literally signed uh, because there was a personal connection with the VC. And I don't even know that they looked in, the, uh, in their data room. <laughs> The fact that after four years, we proved that women are paying online, that the human, women are ready to learn about their, their health. It's only a testament to the tremendous work that the team is doing and the billion dollar valuation speaks itself for itself. I, when I worked there, one of the things I saw is that women who are trying to get pregnant, they basically can pay any money. To me, it's not the celebration of the price tag, it's the question of desperation those women are in. And when we looked into the fertility situation, all the companies that are on the market, they work into infertility solutions. Everybody's trying to treat you better, fix you better, send you to the clinic. Or if they claim that they're doing something a bit earlier, they're very, you know, gated by either special employer, special insurance, etc. There's no solution that is proactive, accessible, and comprehensive to allow you as a woman to take control in your hand. With that in mind, we literally looked for a solution that makes sense. We didn't have a product that we wanted to build. We had a problem space and we met as a lot of experts on the business side, on the technology side, engineering, medical side, to think what can, what can move the needle. We chose three pillar approach digital assessment and fertility report, triage to automated at home testing and labs, and then for those that need comprehensive consultation and follow-ups. The outcome, when you can think about it, is truly a fertility wellness plan, early detection and treatment, egg freezing IVF for the right patients at the right time. Not hooray because I have the insurance and also not waiting to the last moment because it's the resort that I don't want to consider. The product is live. We built the first MVP that you probably link, you, you remember the LinkedIn uh, founders uh, quote, if you shipped something you are not af uh, ashamed of, you shipped too late. So today when we see our MVP, you're like, oh my God, there's so many more things we could have done. But this is where we are. We have the report. Every woman can understand the eight categories of her fertility, what factors need attention, which group she is in, healthy and healthy challenged, and then what are her next steps for the doctor and for herself to move forward. Technically, this is the biggest uh, different, differentiating factor. We don't want to build a new, you know, at home testing or a new telehealth platform because there's nothing unique in there. But we function as a top of the funnel entry point of the fertility journey that it's driven by the fertility predictive modeling. We did our own study. I don't have time to go into it, but all the prediction modeling that we have today takes into account more than 300 data, 300,000 data points that we built on. Uh, American population with different demographics, age groups, et cetera, it's patented. Now we got accepted to the Mayo Clinic program to add additional 60,000 data points of their fertility patients. Discoverability and learning opportunity for the education part of a fertility is enhanced by the fertility LLM that we built on our knowledge graph with the OpenAI 4.0. And it's not built, but will be built the co-pilot for the fertility consultation once you have it done. The, we had only $20,000 to do the launch. <laughs> so we did as much as we could. We got 2,000 women on the platform. This was when be, before we had a paywall because we truly wanted to see whether the product can work, like whether all the pieces come together. And we wanted to see the completion rate on the assessment. And uh, I'm proud to report it's 89% of women who came from really not pre-selected sources that started the assessment and that many completed. Areas that women highlight for them, it's convenience, no judgment, and ability to learn are the top reasons why they felt very comfortable with the brand, so young and so involved in your life. We ask about you know whether you take drugs, uh, what is quality of your uh, sexual life, et cetera. In terms of the revenue model and the market strategy, we're gonna charge for the assessment. 
we're going to do initially one-off purchase. And once we have enough of the product roadmap built out, we'll move to subscription over time. We take the revenue share from all the uh, cross-recommended products or upsell products, at-home testing, consultation, fertility clinic, visits, treatments, and even fertility loans. I don't know how many of you know, but this is actually a thing that women take loans to do egg freezing or IVF. The ref share differs a lot. Uh, on the test, you can imagine it's like 12% of $100, but on the treatment that costs $60,000, even 2%, it's a tremendous um, uh, value for us. What is unique is that we do pre-qualified le leads because we assess women on 100 dimensions and we have them already in the purchase funnel that is pre like ripe to be taken. The distribution, we test several and we are going to do B2B affiliate. It's the most um pack healthy in terms of you know standing out in the uh, groups and also there are so many organizations that care about the topic but have nothing to offer like OBGYN groups private groups family the two contracts we have signed that you have here it's military family foundation that helps women that are partners of soldiers or pilots and the other one is Mira Fertility that helps women to know when they ovulate or not, but beyond ovulation, they offer them nothing and they charge for the $300. So they're gonna get a special deal on Rita. Our team of course is amazing. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, we have female leadership. Katie, uh, our AI lead comes from Tribe AI, which is like the McKinsey on the, of the future. Hannah, who is the full stack engineer, she was um, not, not nominated, uh, selected as a freelancer developer in the UK. Our medical board is truly exceptional. Danny was nominated, was given an award for embryologist of the year. Lucy is the REI, who is also the, uh, the vice president of the ISRM, the Fertility Association in the US. And Liz Lange she's on the board of very innovative groups while running her own practice. On the business side, we have Jarek, who was the head of Abbott and Ab uh, Abvi, Alison, who was a part of regulatory team that sold to Flatiron, Evelyn from the um, Mm, behavioral science group, uh, irrational labs from Dan Ariely, etc. We are talking to you because we are raising five hundred uh, up to five hundred thousand dollars. We 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 don't know exactly uh, to allow us to distribute the B two B to execute two B two B partnerships and to join Mayo uh, AI program to allow us to develop the predictive modeling further. With this money, we expect to get to 100,000 uh, IRR and th then we'll come back to the market to take a proper seat. We are raising on safe. We are pre-money on 10 million. And for every female a per female not, uh, person, I wanted to say for every female who's si uh, going si to sign the check, we're giving 20% discount. That's Great. all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, fascinating platform. If you could un uh, share your screen, please. Um, so does anyone have questions before I get into my, I've got a lot of questions on this one because we do. Oh my gosh. Stuff in this Am I ready? <laughs> but if anyone else has questions, please raise your hand, unmute and, or add into the chat, please. Um, otherwise I will get into mine. No questions. Really? All right. Uh, well, first of all, just a little bit of feedback. Um, definitely know your numbers in terms of how much you're raising and what the use of funds would be. I would like to have seen a slide that said that, that showed, you know, because you kind of were questioning what you were going to raise. I want to know what that money is going to be used for if I invest, right? So you may have had a proof of, a proof of uh, sorry, use of funds slide in the deck um, and maybe not had time to show it, but I want to see where that money is going to go and how long it's going to take you to get to that projected, um, I think it was either an ARR or an MRR, was it sure? 100 million? ARR. ARR. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I'd love to see, to see that. Um, Thank you. I am a little unclear on the model. Obviously, the team is amazing. You guys all have super technical backgrounds. My experience, while limited in fertility, uh, my sister is actually going through this right now, and we have invested quite a bit in this category. So I do know a little bit about investing in it, but um, is it because of the AI model and the and the LLM that uh, data points that you can get to the outcome for these women? Um, yeah. Because so my understanding today, is that it needs to be blood draw, it needs to be a physical, something physical. So can you just explain more about that? Moral today, uh, we are not trying to say that when you go to the doctor, you are getting the right thing, the wrong things. We are saying that women today, when they are starting 
question fertility questions, they cannot go to the doctor's office unless they have been trying to get pregnant ah. and they are unsuccessful. So it's we are moving to that. that. Exactly, exactly. Unless you have, you know, unlimited amount of money and you pay out of pocket or you have progeny or carrot because you have co your company pays and then you say that you are interested in egg freezing. Any other person that says, hey, I want to check my fertility situation, they don't have the way to do that. And in terms of what is needed, the blood tests, the ultrasounds, these are the elements that contribute to it. But even a very good doctor, they look, they take into account all other factors, fertility health of your mom, family situation, fertility health of your partner, where you grew up, what your goals are. So what we did, we digitalized the general assessment that can be done ahead of time that already triage you at the step one, and we do it from the convenience of your phone. So you can do it in your sofa, you can do it, you know, waiting in the line for the restaurant. What is unique beyond is that when you think today, when you talk to women, they use two entry points for their fertility measurement. Am I 35? Below, I'm healthy. After, I'm wrong. You know that uh, it's not the mark. And also AMH test, because modern fertility, when they launched, fertility test was the best performing ad on Facebook. And this is what women think AMH is. I, ACOG is trying to cut through the noise and say, no, this is only extrapolation of your ovarian reserve. But it's not true. So how do we let women understand that many things define the fertility uh, situation? It's the goal. But does it accelerate the conversation or the ability for the end user to get into the doctors to solve the problem? So the way, so first of all, you first give you a red, green, orange, red assessment where you stand. Maybe you don't have to see the doctor. Maybe the panic mode that you are in is actually disserving you and you can relax because your situation is good. You don't have to worry about it. But if those that need extra, we then tell them what factors need attention and we go with them to an OBGYN and we say, hey, I'm having the fit. I'm not saying like I'm infertile, but I'm, I have UTIs too often. I have pelvic pain. My period is irregular. Let's look into it. So then you allow yourself to do that. And then if you need extra follow on, we will have the REI in the platform already that you are able to connect. For now, you need to use to your own money to pay. So it's not like the system will help help you, but at least you will be connected to the knowledge that it's profiled for you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I just want to say I really appreciate the proactive and positive messaging piece. Um, I think that that is a really differentiated approach. Most people come at this conversation from a fear-based model. So I think that that is a really mm -hmm. unique conversation. So I did want to call that out. Can you talk a little bit about the um, subscription model? I'm unclear as to what would happen. Like you do this assessment. I see that I might may have issues. How does this then become a subscription model? Even if you don't have issues to maintain the good status uh, of your fertility, it's your responsibility because with age, your situation shifts. So what are the things that every three months you need to check in? What are the good behaviors that are relevant for you? What are the... And we know uh, in the uh, user group work we do, it's often that women want to prepare for fertility that not need medical intervention, but they need career uh, coaching. Like how do they prepare for talking at the, with their boss that they want to get pregnant? How do they talk to their partners about children? So what is the preparation ahead of time that makes sense for the woman that uh, she gains the toolkit to be ready when she is? How financially she plans? What are the check-in points in terms of additional pap smear, when is the time to do the STI check, what at-home testing you can actually send to you. So the plan is like 11 action areas that will profile to you and send it over over time. Our goal is to start shifting conversation of fertility, not from the moment when I'm ready, but five years out. So then this is becoming the LTV of the subscription journey. Got it. That makes more sense. And actually that leads into my next question, which was, you know, usually you have this issue at that moment, which is what you were just calling out, um, which means you have to touch that person at that time and that moment. But it sounds like from a marketing perspective, there's a much wider swath in terms of your targeting. Can you speak a little bit about your GTM? Yes. Um, therefore, uh, the affiliate programs, it's what we tested out. We tried the influencers and of course you can do uh, traditional paid marketing or the programs, but the noise in wellness, it's, it's high. But when you think about groups that care about women or have women in their 
you know, uh, strong audiences, there are many. And there's a lot of empowerment and actually me to move and women speaking out, more younger generation actually advocating for themselves. It's a very ripe, um, ri very ripe group. And the intrinsic fear of the clock ticking, it's not that we need to establish. We just need to make you know. So the very interesting points like, do you need to egg freeze? Because uh, often women uh, say, oh, it's egg freezing for me. So it's one that we capture. And second one is like, you as a woman plan your future well. So the affiliate groups is for the uh, college graduates. Often those people want to break, ha balance the career and family. How do we do it? So with the association that cross sell to alumni of, of not necessarily Ivy League because they have a lot of other things going on for them, but tier two universities, church associations, family, uh, women empowered groups, this family military groups, et cetera. So it sounds like you have maybe three or four target audiences in terms of demographics, psychographics as well, or more. I think the demographic is truly one. A woman who like woman who wants to be a mom, not today, but in the next several years, and she wants to prepare herself. Uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, how much of the market. Uh, adjustments we need to do with the personas and things we'll we're too young to tell you of course we'll be listening to and will be adaptive to how much we did maybe there's going to be a need for the co-marketing that will come that the partner will have more presence in their tbd to be honest got it uh last question shrewd asks do you have plans to expand uh beyond just the window of fertility into broader women's health support i think this is also part of the education conversation which is clearly going to be so key to the success of the brand absolutely so um, a lot of people ask for that. My true answer to it is we spend so much time understanding the problem in fertility and how it's unserved that I don't know what our unique value would be afterward. There's so much noise in parenting and follow on, et cetera, that I, I'd rather cross uh, sell to male fertility and preparing the couples for becoming a family uh, is the next step. And then I think what is the unique value that we can deliver? I just don't, I cannot answer that well now. Uh, fantastic. Well, that was amazing. Thank you, Camila. Thank you for the work that you're doing. As Thank I you said, for the I... feedback. I appreciate it <laughs> a lot. Yes, of no, course. It's very good. It's really important, especially as you said, women are having babies later in life. They're focusing more on their careers um, my sister would kill me for talking about this publicly, but she she's had this experience, which is why I have a personal experience with this currently. So there's a clear, clear need here. So thank you for the work that you're de thank doing. Thank you. I appreciate greatly. And thank you all, uh, all the other comments. I'm going to read them now in the chat. Yes. And I have um, a, a company that we've invested in. They're rebranding, but they're currently Mate Fertility and they're um, in this space and would probably be a great connection for you. So please reach out thank and we'll you. get connected with the founder there. All right, we are halfway through, which means it is time for a stretch break. So because, you know, as I always say, stretch, sitting is slowly killing us all. So everyone needs to stand up, stretch it out a little bit. Oh, make sure that you can last the next three pitches and be engaged. Uh, I always just like to do a little bit of stretching to make sure that we're not just sitting here for two hours straight because it's a it's a hard stretch to sit for two hours. So that's just the um, the founder in me. I want to make sure everyone is healthy and happy and engaged. So that is our stretch break. And we're going to get back into it. All right. Our next picture is uh, No Limbits. Erica, are you with us? I am. Hello. I am very excited. And I appreciate that stretch break. <laughs> Can you see my slides okay? We can, yes. Amazing. Um, so excited to be here. My name is Erica. I'm the founder and CEO of No Limits. Um, the B is silent, and that is because I'm an amputee, and No Limits is an adaptive apparel company for people with disabilities. Our mission is to increase comfort, confidence, and independence in those who struggle with clothing due to a disability. Um, I started this company shortly after losing my leg in a car accident. My first prosthetic was around the size of a soccer ball around my calf, and I was actually cutting off the leg of my pants, stuffing it into my prosthetic. I was unable to wear my prosthetic for a number of months because that was causing sores. And so eventually grew from me doing alterations on a sewing machine, um, and I'm excited to tell you about where we're at today. Um, it's certainly not an issue that's unique to amputees alone. It's actually 
really a challenge across a variety of people with disabilities. Um, it's worth $2.6 billion in the U.S. alone in the four key categories that we serve, growing 18% year over year. And this is largely due to an aging population and a population that is aging in place. Those four key categories that I'm talking about, um, the first one on the left is the Unlimited Collection. It was our first product designed specifically for amputees, but actually we have a lot of folks with AFOs, braces, and people with lymphedema who use these as well. We launched a sensory-friendly collection for folks with commonly ADHD or autism, but who have sensory processing challenges. This is mostly textureless, seamless fabrics, um, that are made to reduce as much sensory stimuli from your clothing as possible. The third category is for wheelchair users. I'm going to do a deep dive into that in a second. And then our fourth category is for folks with limited dexterity in their hands. So a lot of times this is folks with Parkinson's who have had strokes or who have muscle tone challenges. And if you kind of take a look at this space, you'll see a couple of themes. Um, one, there aren't that many people serving it. Two, it's often medicalized um, in a way that it's we've forgotten that it's a fashion product. It's coming from very much a caretaker perspective um, and it's coming from the medical community or it's so expensive that it's actually inaccessible for people with disabilities. I want to take you through one of our more technical products to kind of show you why people with disabilities need something special. So this is a, an example of our wheelchair pants. The innovation here is a little bit hard to see because actually um, these are designed for a seated form. And if you go to fashion school, you will learn to design on the standing body. These were designed for the seated form. So this means we're designing for folks who have had a little bit of hip spread or leg atrophy from being in a wheelchair for an extended period of time. It's a high rise back with a low rise front. And then we have these side zippers. So you can dress laying down, which is how wheelchair users will be taught to dress in occupational therapy. Um, this also allows the front of this garment to fold open to allow for catheter changes throughout the day. Back pockets on wheelchair pants can cause bed sores, so we moved them to the thigh where they're actually accessible when you're seated. Um, and then we went as far as to reinforce belt loops because we were noticing that caretakers were using belt loops to help assist people in transfers. And so I'm really hoping that you're seeing kind of the level of intention and detail that goes into every one of our product categories. And this isn't just a clothing brand. So in the same way that your traditional clothing allows for self-expression, adaptive clothing does too, but it does some other cool things. So the second cool thing that it does is it can remove barriers to participation. We designed one of the world's first adaptive jackets in response to a survey that showed that over half of people with disabilities saw outerwear as a barrier to participation in winter activities. The third thing it can do is increase a level of independence. So in a lot of folks, this means being able to dress or use the restroom independently where you might not have been able to before. And the fourth one we're still working on, the fourth one, we believe that if we can impact someone's quality of life and independence, we can thereby impact their long-term health outcomes. And this is something that we're working on with Hanger Clinic, which is the largest prosthetic and orthotic provider in the US. We have a marketing collaboration with over 900 of their clinical locations, but we're also working on clinical studies to prove the health outcomes between adaptive clothing um, and health outcomes in these patients. And that's in order to make a case for FSA, HSA, and insurance reimbursability in our space. So this is something that you'll not see a traditional apparel company do. We also do things that traditional apparel companies do. Um, so we've started on uh, direct-to-consumer, and this year we've had phenomenal success in wholesale. So we sold 24,000 units into Walmart this year as a sensory-friendly launch. Um, that's actually expected to 10x next year into 50 doors and then 200 doors in 2026. Uh, I went live on QVC for the first time last week selling the jacket that I was talking about. Um, and this year we've reached 30,000 people with adaptive clothing 
that's expected to 10x next year through these partnerships. Um, we've had a tremendous amount of press. It's really, my point here is to emphasize that it's important to show up authentically in this space and to show up as a lifestyle brand in this space. We're a fashion company that serves people with disabilities. We are not a medical company. And it's really important to our consumers that they see us show up in these authentic fashion spaces to make it exciting to wear, not like a medical device. Another interesting thing that we're doing is we're actually acquiring another brand in this space. The brand that we're acquiring is really the market leader in senior focused adaptive apparel. And so this has much more of a caretaker lens to it. Um, often focusing on folks who are bedridden, who have Alzheimer's, um, or who need caretaker intervention when dressing. Um, the founders of this company are 76 and looking to retire. They built a phenomenal company. They're doing three and a half million dollars top line near break even this year. Um, and we will acquire relationships into almost every single nursing home in the country through this acquisition. We also share a lot of operational synergies with this brand. Um, we got a phenomenal deal on this company. It's just really allowing us to serve the breadth of needs in the adaptive space in a way that makes us the market leader in adaptive apparel once this acquisition is complete early December. We have a phenomenal team. Um, so my COO was formerly COO of a company called Rabbit. You can find them in REI. They are a technical running apparel company. Um, Anna Peshock is a, also a person with a disability. Um, she has a bachelor's in fashion design and a master's in medical device innovation because she designed her career around adaptive clothing. She served as the director of product in two startups previously, both of which got phenomenal exits. So we're really lucky to have her. Um, and Todd Stockbauer is our fractional CFO. He was formerly CFO of Spider, the ski apparel company through their international expansion. Uh, we were on Shark Tank. We got a deal with Mark Cuban and Emma Greed. Um, they've been phenomenal partners. Still can't believe that I get to work with them on a regular basis. Um, Charles Hammerman is president of the Disability Opportunity Fund. Uh, they're leading our current round. Uh, and Kimberly Nixon was one of the first employees at Under Armour. And so she's been a phenomenal mentor, um, kind of drawing parallels between Under Armour and No Limits Early Growth. Combined with the company we're acquiring, we'll do 4.4 million in revenue this year, um, growing rapidly due to our wholesale expansion um, and through expansion into our clinical and nursing home partnerships, um, hitting profitability in the next six months. Uh, this is to show the revenue breakdown by channel, kind of by 2026, we get to this point where we see a very textbook kind of 40, 60% uh, D to C wholesale sales mix to optimize cash flow. This is really common in apparel companies. Um, wanted to talk about exit strategy for a second. So we see Walmart and Gap Inc. as phenomenal acquirers in this space. We're starting to have kind of early conversations. Uh, it's a 10X EBITDA multiplier typically in apparel, uh, but we believe because we have healthcare ties and if we get... FSA, HSA, and insurance reimbursability in our products. This actually puts us in a top line revenue multiplier instead of that EBITDA rep multiplier. Um, we've just got 200,000 left in our two and a half million dollar series A. Uh, it's a price round at a $10 million pre-money valuation. Would love to have you participate if you're interested. And this goes to my LinkedIn. Thank you so much for the chance to, to participate. Perfect timing. Um, wow. What an incredible pitch, Erica. Thank you so much Thank for you. the time today um, and for all your success. Uh, incredible traction. And funnily enough, I was on a call with Kimberly Nixon just today, checking in with her. We do a lot of deal flow together. So, Oh my gosh. Amazing. Yeah, okay. Love well, I'm meeting That's with her Friday. System. <laughs> I love it. Uh, we've got some people that are happy to make some intros for you in the chat. Um, any questions before I get into mine in the room? Um, the chat's been blowing up. Everyone's super excited about what you're building. But does anyone have any questions before I dig into mine? 
All righty. Um, what does aging in place mean? I'm not sure I understand what that, that means. Aging in the home versus like an emphasis on home health care versus going to a nursing home or assisted care facility. Got it. Thank you. Um, you talked about the uh, medical coverage of the, of the products. How long does that process take? Or I know there's probably no perfect answer to that, but on average, is there a, a range of time? We're kind of looking at a two-year strategy. Um, the phenomenal news is Walmart's putting their weight behind it with us. They have a lobbying arm in DC and are looking for a lot of any ways that um, Walmart customers don't have to pay for products that are carried by Walmart. Um, so they're putting their weight behind our, it'll take some um, some legislation. So we're kind of building a consortium around that and doing the clinical studies at the same time. Likely we'll have to take a product category by category approach. So it'll happen in stages instead of all at once. Thank you. And that actually leads into my next question, which was, you said you were working on some uh, clinical um, clinical studies. What is the time we look like on that as well? So we're starting that middle of next year. The first study, study we're doing is um, rates of UTIs in wheelchair users, if they have access to wheelchair appropriate clothing, because then you don't have to transfer out of the chair to do catheter changes throughout the day. Um, so that's our first product that we're looking for, for coverage on. Awesome. Uh, we had someone in the chat that said uh, privately, um, exit, go to private equity. There's so much capital seeking growing small cap businesses. You should be able to get a 13 to 16 X EBITDA multiple. So just a little, little tip there if you Ooh. don't want to exit with the... Um, the big ones. Um, but I do want to say I appreciated you uh, noting an exit strategy. I think that for all the founders on the call today and in general, we like to see that you're really thoughtful about what that exit looks like, because that's what us as a venture fund are, are excited about long term. So thank you for including that. Um, on the just a little note on the team slide, your team our team's very impressive, but you noted a bunch of different logos on them. I would like to add or different brands that mm. they've worked under. I think I'd love to see visually the logos. Yeah. On, I think that, you know, I'm a visual learner. A lot of the people on the call are visual mm. learners. It just speaks for itself instead of you having to say all the different brands. So that would just be one little note there. Thank um, you. Yeah. Uh, let's see what else. Oh, your M&A strategy. So talk a little bit about if that's going to continue down the path. How did that conversation come to be? Was that always part of the roadmap? It was not always part of the roadmap. Um, it was really a, a phenomenal timing moment. Um, so they had seen my my Shark Tank video and when they were looking to sell the company, reached out. They really wanted to continue their legacy. Um, and so we worked out a phenomenal deal structure with very little cash out front um, and kind of an earn out, um, almost seller's note type structure. Um, we are, this space is prime for kind of a, a p and &E roll-up strategy. There are a lot of small players that could lead to a larger exit. So we have, um, one of our lead investors is actually dedicating a, someone to doing an analysis on the other smaller brands in the space that could potentially kind of be next to just roll it all up into one. It makes a lot of sense in this industry. Yeah, I totally agree. That was the exact direction I was going in. If that is the direction you end up going in, will you raise more in a different round or will that be more of a PE play? Like what would that look like if, I mean, that path seems to be a natural fit? Yeah, I agree. Um, the benefit to th the company that we're acquiring has a 46 year history of profitability. And so we're actually planning on leveraging that to grow more with debt than with, um, uh, equity from here on. And so, so there are some phenomenal SBA 7A programs for acquisitions, especially if we have that history um, and kind of traditional bankability going for us. So that's more the roadmap, which is why we're doing a price round this round as well. That makes sense. I think uh, using leveraged capital would probably make a lot more sense in that longer term strategy. A um, couple more questions. You had noted that you had hit kind of a high level of pre-COVID revenue at $7 million, and then this year was three point five. million. What, what happened there? Just talk us through a little bit about that. Was it just simply the COVID and people weren't purchasing or, you know, tell us a little bit about what happened. So that's specifically the company that we're acquiring um, ah, that hit right. that seven. But exactly what happened, that COVID is what happened. And so um, they were 
72 at the time. They had built this business to kind of maintain. They had relationships into every nursing home. Nursing homes saw a lot of turnover during that time. They lost some of those relationships and didn't have a sales team in place to rebuild them. So that's part of why now is the time that kind of we're stepping in. They're like, we're not like interested in rebuilding this right now, kind of the bones are there. So we'll implement a sales team to rebuild those, but those customers haven't gone away. It's just a lot of the social workers that they had relationships with in the nursing homes who are the actual purchasers for that business um, saw a lot of tur turnover during COVID. That makes sense. And maybe I didn't read it correctly, but maybe there needs to be a, a bigger call out where that's like a separate company. Cause I saw that as on your roadmap revenue wise, um, I don't know if I just didn't see the page properly. That could be on me. Yeah, I appreciate that. I'll work on making that a little more clear visually. Thank you. Um, and then just talk a little bit about your marketing strategy. I know you've been really focused on um, direct to consumer and that's been super successful. Now you're more um, wholesale focused, but um, what are the strategies on both from a marketing perspective? Yeah, we're really leaning into our clinical, uh, clinical model. It's where we've seen... Um, the best CAC in uh, like prosthetists, occupational therapists are referring patients to us. They're actually teaching people how to dress with our product in clinical settings. And so just being really intentional about that has been way more efficient than kind of dumping money into digital ad spend. Though we do do some of that as well, again, to kind of maintain this balance of we are a fashion brand. And so you want to have that message reinforced, even though we're showing up in medical spaces. Um, so it's been a little bit of, of balance there, um, but we're building out a sales team for this clinical model. Um, actually, the company that we're acquiring does the their only marketing activity is sending physical catalogs, which I think is actually phenomenal for this market. Um, so we're going to start, we're, we're actually leaning into that pretty heavily as well. They have a phenomenal ROI on those catalogs. It's insane. So I don't know, just a note for any CPG folks out there, like we've come full circle. <laughs> it's so true. We talk about uh, how busy our inboxes are, but our mailboxes are still really great targets. I think that that's so funny. And uh, Amanda says, yes, direct mailers for healthcare is definitely where it's at. Uh, and she also said, we send faxes to pharmacies. Oh, That's my genius. God. oh I love that. Yeah. I might steal that. There you go. It's part of the uh, value add of the, um, of the ecosystem. Um, Shrut said, there's also a good influencer network of occupational therapists on social media. Have you been targeting there? Yes. And um, our, our customer service person is actually an occupational therapist because we were getting so many questions from OTs. We're like, let's just have someone who speaks that language. Um, we've been, yeah, very um, focused on, on that market for sure. Fantastic. I mean, absolutely brilliant pitch. You guys have such great traction and this is only a growing and evolving market, especially on the aging side with all of our parents, um, living so much longer, um, thanks to modern medicine. So I think that, that, I didn't know that was an 18% year over year growth in that category. That's wild. They um, call it the silver tsunami is the, the name of the market, which I think is pretty brilliant, actually. I have heard that. Um, we've just got about a minute left. So the last question I have is like, what's your biggest challenge right now? Um, our biggest challenge is, is bandwidth currently. I, I know that this, this acquisition, so our change of hand state is actually December 6th, is going to take, um, definitely not underestimating what that's going to take from our team. Um, but also getting a Walmart order across the finish line and a QVC order across the finish line um, was certainly took like 100 percent of our team. And so we're now kind of working on hiring dedicated resources. Um, and the next key hire that we need to make is a, a senior level um, marketing hire. And so that'll be the next kind of challenge. And I personally don't have that experience. We don't have it on the team yet. So I'm looking for kind of mentorship in that space. If anyone has any insights there. Well, we certainly do that. That was our first bailiwick in terms of being an agency. So call me, we'll have a conversation. I'm sure we'll chat afterwards. Fantastic job. Um, thank, and thank you. you for your time, Erica. Amazing. Thank um, you so much. And I will also just say that Erica had so many folks behind her championing her that she got connected to me and thus got to pitch today. So you, you have amazing people behind you, Erica, really well done. 
Um, all right. As a reminder, please provide feedback in the QR code or in the link. I believe Gigi is going to drop it in again now because um, if you have connections, if you want to get connected to the founders, this is the best way to do that. So Gigi is going to drop that feedback form link in. Look, it's like magic. Um, thanks, Gigi. And next up, we have personal fave with Hannah and Stephanie, who I have known for quite some time. They um, came to me through Women Founders Network, I believe, as well. So fantastic. Take it away. Wonderful. Good afternoon. It is so awesome to see so many incredible women founders and what you guys are all doing is beyond inspiring. So just to be in this crew today feels pretty special. So Thank you, thank you, thank you. We are the founders of, of Personal Faith. What is that? A little different than some of the things you've heard, but there are some overlaps. Um, we make sexual health and wellness products. Can everyone see our screen okay? I just wanna make sure. Okay, great. Um, so we are here to empower people to prioritize their pleasure, diffuse shame and stigma around sexual health and wellness by providing people with not only education, but most importantly, the cleanest products on the market, uh, also made with natural aphrodisiacs, which we love, um, but a huge educational opportunity as it relates to what is currently on the market and how we're gonna flip this industry on its head. Yeah, one of our, a few of our core um, values are, we wanna make sure we are offering, as Hannah mentioned, the cleanest, most efficacious, but also, championing a sustainable supply chain, inclusivity, as well as feeling as good as possible. Um, we wanna make sure that this is a fun and approachable conversation, as well as making sure that people understand that they should take stock of what they're putting on and inside of themselves, especially what's touching your reproductive organs. Um, my name is Stephanie, this is Hannah, um, we're the founders. It's so great to be here. And as Laura mentioned, it's been a long time coming. Um, so I am specialized a little bit more so in product R&D business development. Um, my background is non-traditional. I come from music and entertainment and start this whole concept started with a crazy UTI experience that I had um, and led to more research as to what is actually in these products and what the regulation is around what is sold at conventional um, drug stores, as well as in mass retail. Um, currently, I am a Tory Birch Founder Fellow for this year. Um, and yeah, Hannah and I have been best friends since the ninth grade. We go way back and I call myself a CPG startup junkie. I was one of the first employees at the Honest Company when we launched in 2012 and helped them build and grow for their first six years. And then while behind the scenes, I was helping a lot of other brands in the CPG startup space, Solo Wave, Solo Wedding, um, build their name and during that process, Stephanie tapped me on the shoulder, told me about this very scary infection she experienced, knew how passionate I was about clean products and educating people about that. And I saw what was on the market was pretty gross and quite scary. <laughs> um, and, and what we're seeing, these are headlines, real headlines that are happening um, that shocked me when I was doing my research. Um, and for instance, sperm count is down 58% since 2018. What are factors that lead to that? How can we support that um, by providing education and clean products? So if you have ever purchased a conventional sex product, they're on the shelves, it's there. So don't, no shame in your game, but it's highly likely that there were some pretty terrifying ingredients, endocrine disruptors, phthalates, parabens, um, especially if they were in plastic bottles, that means microplastics get into the formula. And if we're eating organic and wearing clean makeup, probably what's touching um, our most precious skin should be held to a similar standard and make it so it is something you want to grab for on the shelves as well. Yeah, what we came to was wanting to make the cleanest, but also most beautiful products on the market. Um, we put our packaging um, in bright colors, but with very understated bottles, as you'll see. But we just want to make sure that they're beyond effective, clean, as well as we're having fun. We don't want this to be a sterile or fully medical conversation um, so that people can understand that 
this is an important conversation to have, um, as well as helping to empower people to prioritize their pleasure. So um, currently we have three SKUs to market. We have our water-based plant-based sex serum, which we came to market with in 2021, our oil base with CBD, which is an arousal enhancement product, as well as our latest product, our Play Wipes, which are pH matched, flushable, biodegradable, and at-home compostable. Diving deeper into wet, this is what we first came to market with. Um, it's currently HSA, FSA eligible, which is wonderful. Um, we love having that offer. And in our first year, Goop picked this up and we're currently still in all Goop stores and Goop retailers. What we have received in terms of feedback anecdotally from our customer base is that this really feels like their own natural lubrication. There are many groups, one in three vulva owners, in fact, that cannot naturally lubricate. And so providing them with a solution that feels good and is good for them, whether they're postpartum, peri -post menopause, or have other things in their microbiome going on where they need a little support, um, this has been the solution for them. A happy accident occurred last year where we uh, did not realize, but Texas Tech did a blind study on us. We were published in an academic journal and presented at a medical conference for advances in reproductive sciences. So this formula outperformed the number one fertility lubricant on the market, which is called Preseed uh, for sperm motility. And with that, there have been a lot of personal fave babies that have come into the world. And with that, those have turned into several angel investors for us. <laughs> yeah. Um, similar but different, um, Peak is our um, arousal enhancement product. It's made with full spectrum CBD as well as Bulgarian Bros. The way that this product works is it's a true vasodilator. So wherever you apply it topically, it stimulates blood flow to the area. So it really gets you where you're trying to go that much faster or will actually enhance your orgasms. Um, and then Play, which is what we came out with, is one of our latest creations it's actually in partnership with biome a different startup that we're friendly with that makes all different kinds of wipes they are flushable ph matched compostable and biodegradable um these are amazing we're actually doing a test next month with fab fit fun and getting into other retailers now these are one of our, our um gateway products <laughs> um that help people understand that sexual wellness is something they should care about and help bring them into the tent here with us when we talk about future products, we really want to win in the category of sexual health and wellness and not just be another personal care brand. You know, we kind of did things untraditionally and went after a taboo space to blow it up. Um, so speaking of gateway drugs, a lot of people know and use wipes. A lot of people know and use chapstick, lip balm. We have in production the actual goop at our manufacturer, an alternative or a safer alternative to Aquaphor and Vaseline. But what's special about this is it can be used on any chapped skin, not just your lips, downstairs, elbows, and it's safe for breastfeeding moms with chapped nipples. Um, what we're really excited about, Stephanie and I are both originally from Boston, so being able to speak to biochemists and bioengineers at MIT lately has been a pinch me moment, and that comes around for re engineering the condom. Using regenerative materials, it's a really antiquated space that needs to be have a little shake up to it. And we are on to take that challenge. People have been talking about us. It's cr pretty cool to see some of the magazines and publications that we know and love from growing up normalizing this space and shifting the narrative so that people can reclaim their power and their pleasure. And so seeing write-ups in Cosmo and Glamour, Refinery29 and so on um, has been a pretty fun pinch me moment for us. Yeah, we're seeking $2 million um, as a six on a $6 million valuation cap as our pre-seed raise. Um, this is going to help us with our further retail distribution. We're currently in 200 doors nationwide and in talks with large big box retailers. We know that we need um, an adequate funding for both slotting, marketing, as well as other support. Um, and where we've been in conversations for what feels like a long time, but getting to the finish line. So totally understand where some other founders are at. 
and are really excited to just expand because we have been more retail forward. It's really hard in our space to be D2C. There's a lot of censorship and red tape around talking about sex products. So making sure we're at the point of sale and meeting the customers where they are on shelf is our goal. Um, and in terms of like our projected growth, it's based off of retail. We are more heavily weighted towards retail. Um, it's been that way since our launch year and we're just excited to continue to hit um, the trajectory that we know we need to as it relates to getting into some of these nationwide doors alongside the growth that we've seen in the adult channel, um, which is sometimes neglected by some of our competitors. We're a scrappy operation. It's just the two of us. We're running lean and um, we're really grateful to be amongst this audience today. So thank you so much. Thank you. Nice mm -hmm. to meet you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, ladies. Um, if you could unshare, perfect. Uh, first of all, I just want to give it up for all the um, conversations we've been having today around some really taboo topics that most people are really uncomfortable talking about. I think that's part of what we bring to the table as fabric. We want to make sure that we are demystifying and destigmatizing so many of these conversations. So the fact that you all showed up today and are in this conversation with these founders is really, really meaningful. So I just wanted to call that out. Um, any questions in the room? Um, any questions in the room before I get into mine? No. All right. Um, feel free to add in the chat. Oh, we did get one. I got a private one. Seems like you have a lot of overlap in product design and ethos with Elf Cosmetics. Have you considered selling the brand? Oh, we haven't heard that yet, but I like hearing that because Target is a aspirational door for us. I know that's a big target brand. And um, we we thank you for saying that because we're brand snobs and freaks. So packaging is huge for us. So I like that. Yeah, we haven't thought about Elf as a strategic, but we've definitely been exploring further conversations in terms of, I guess, earlier M&A activity than what we were initially planning on with bigger um, toy brands in the adult space, um, as well as understanding that we know we need to be banded together with other people in order to make a bit of, a bigger splash, um, just to get more eyeballs as well as awareness around our brand um, as we continue to grow and scale. I love it. Uh, you brought up um, Elf because we do have a contact there specifically in their venture team. So reach out. We'll connect the dots for you there. So great to bring that up. Um, everyone's loving the brand, loving the billboards, all the things. Uh, lots of notes in the chat. Not a lot of questions. So I'm just going to get into mine. Um, you had really exponential growth this year. Is that um, projected or is that actual? We're coming to the end of the year. So how close are you on target to that number? Um, that was honestly very much projected um, <laughs> in terms of where we're going to land. It may be closer to half of that, um, just given that some of these conversations with Ulta, Walmart, Whole Foods are just taking a little bit longer than we ever anticipated. Um, it seems like retail in general had a very interesting year, to say the least. Um, so... We're just excited to continue to broaden our distribution and know that we're going to hit these numbers when we're given the doors. Um, we kind of have what's called shelf appeal um, and don't do all that much marketing um, on top of that. So it's been pretty incredible just to see as we continue to expand just from a door count um, and statewide perspective, like how that predicts uh, where we go in terms of our revenue growth. I appreciate the honesty with that. And you are not alone. Uh, consumer retail uh, CPGs had a really hard year. It's been very splintered. So hopefully we'll be back on track in terms of your projections into 2025. Um, but we're seeing that across the board. So we're with you. We feel your pain. Trust us. Uh, you talked a lot about your PR. Was that organic or did you actually hire um, a publicist to expand into those publications? A little bit of both, like for getting into goop doors and online, that was us being completely shameless, which as founders, especially female founders, I think, I think a lot of people can, that can resonate with you really just got to throw yourself out there to the point where I found the goop buyers and dropped products off on their doors, um, with their consent. Um, but we had a couple of boutique PR people every now and then, but with funds, we could only allocate so much. So we got pretty lucky in many of those write-ups. Yeah, I was 
Yeah. Right. Early days, we definitely used like a bigger PR firm. And I would say that was probably one of our most excellent mistakes. Um, however, I think just making sure that we're out there and doing a lot in terms of influencer gifting as well as editor gifting just on a continual or more organic basis is how we've gotten as much coverage as we have. Which we will definitely email you, Erica, because we have been talking to OT and we've been at pelvic floor conferences. So we got you. <laughs> Love it. Uh, we got a question about, I think, safety for dentures or bridges. Oh, that's honestly a first one, but I, we'd have to look into that. I feel like it should be fine based off of the research that we've done and what we have. But Julie, I like this question. I, I think it would be great only because, you know, I have elderly parents or friends and we tease them about, you know, set, being sexually active. And, you know, I mean, why not for, why for not? people? Yeah. Oh, we love job, it. Ladies. We love it, Julie. You get Julie, it, girl. You're the biggest hype woman for your parents, so we will make sure to get them product. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, moving on to packaging. Uh, your packaging is super intentional, really beautiful, but I believe you guys have evolved that. That wasn't the first packaging that you started with. I remember you guys get, sending me something super, super early days. Can you talk a little bit about the evolution on the packaging? It's been pretty consistent. I don't know if we had, it might've been super samples like before even launch, but for us, what was so important is to your point, very intentional down to the design on everything. So blue and purple, we wanted it to be no matter what gender you identify for something that it's really appealing to you, not too femme, not too masculine. And then black glass bottles, um, this is chic. You can leave this out on your nightstand without shame, without feeling awkward. It's a beautiful product and it also protects the ingredients, um, which are all plant derived and clean ingredients. But there's even, you know, the lines at the front of this box. I'll send everyone pictures, but they go in and out to show connection. This has a wave building to show the build of Climax. So we really do have a lot of fun with it. Um, with little cheeky notes, we really like our brand archetype is part jester, part caretaker, because it is fun and we can be silly and be punny with things, but we also want to make sure that, you know, we have your back and that you're taken care of. Your back, your front, your nipples, everything. <laughs> yeah, everything. <laughs> yeah, I love I mean, it. There's even stevia in this one for the denture conversation. <laughs> so it is in case again in your mouth so there you go there you go actually this brings up a good point which maybe uh those of you who have products in the pitch maybe you want to add a little um code for anyone who'd like to purchase we would love to pay it forward and make sure that this is a super efficient conversation and maybe we can help with a little bit of sell through so um send that over to Gigi privately in the chat uh, and she can add that into the wrap-up email that will go out to our whole audience um, my next question is about the plant-based, um, the plant-basedness, I guess, of the product. Can you talk a little bit about other products? And I didn't realize that they were non-vegan, non-plant-based. Um, can you just share a little bit about that? Yeah, most of what is on the market at your drugstore is filled with phthalates, parabens, endocrine disruptors, which can really mess up your pH and can lead to things like UTIs, um, which is uncomfortable and not so much fun. Yeah. I mean, there's also just a lot, a huge common ingredient in a lot of lubricants is just glycerin, um, which is, can be, um, plant derived. However, it can lead to not just UTIs, but a lot of yeast infections as well as BV. So we really just wanted to make sure that everything that we do and every ingredient that we use, um, will not lead to these things. Like you know, I made a joke about the stevia, but it also has antifungal, antimicrobial qualities. So it helps offset that in addition. Um, and I think there's just something to be said about making sure that things have real ingredients in them and are not made with, you know, any SLS or petrochemicals or anything that really shouldn't be in any of your personal care products, but particularly touching your reproductive organs. If you see fragrance or perfume listed on any of your products, that is an unregulated cocktail of ingredients that people can just smack on. Um, ew. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then my last question is around your product roadmap. You're very ambitious. 
Uh, and I love to see that. Um, obviously, there's a lot of disruption that needs to happen in the common space, like you said, but you guys are still very early days in terms of growth. So I just want to make sure that you're focused. And what does the timeline look like on that um, on that product roadmap? Yeah, it's definitely, you know, a few years away, just to be totally transparent, we're going to need to allocate, um, you know, at least $100,000 initially from spend for R&D and definitely need to map out true go, no-go points, which is what we did when we were creating our first formulations for the, lubri the lubricants. There's not only going to be just the development process, but also much more rigorous testing associated um, to, you know, make sure there's no STIs, pregnancies, um, and everything else, especially if we are really um, researching a new plant derived material, which is what what we so desire um, and hope to bring to market someday. But like down that. to our packaging, it's even going to be cute. The condoms are going to be cute. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the condoms are not cute right now. <laughs> Uh, fantastic. Well, ladies, thank you so much. I've known you for some time and it's been really amazing to watch you grow and evolve as a brand. It's, it's been an honor. So thank you for the time today. And last up, we have Rachel Cooperman with uh, Ease Labs. Rachel, are you with us? I am. Hi, thanks so much. It's actually eyes. Eyes, <laughs> sorry. No problem. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much. It's been great to listen to the pitches. Um, let me share my screen. All right, can you guys see that? Almost, oh, there we go, perfect. Okay, great. So um, my name's Rachel, um, I'm a pediatric neurologist. Uh, I ran the pediatric epilepsy program at UCSF uh, in Oakland for 10 years and really started the company out of uh, just witnessing this significant unmet clinical need. And my goal really is to change the way that we manage and diagnose neurological and psychiatric disease. Mm -hmm. So um, take a step back. So uh, my co-founders, um, Jit, his background is in scientific computing. I initially started doing research um, while I was at UCSF because all my patients would tell me the same thing, which was when my loved one had a seizure or um, or lost consciousness, you could see this kind of strange glazed over appearance to their eyes. And that's how they knew they were seizing. And I said, well, we now have technology to measure that. Let's see if we can measure that. Because one of the big challenges in caring for someone who has a neurological or psychiatric disorder is, is that the onus of, of reporting falls on the family, meaning they have to tell the doctor exactly what's happening and um, how the patient is doing, because there is no other, there's no glucometer um, like they have for diabetes. There's no thermometer like you have for infectious disease and neurological disorders. So it's all the patient's responsibility. And so the goal really was to change that. Um, and so we set out to use eye movements to help and support decision-making for better outcomes for patients. And so um, JIT did the research with me initially, which was patented while well as UCSF. And then Parth joined on um, with his background in medical devices to help bring this to market. Uh, he spent 20 years at Siemens and Varian, um, and he always likes to say that neurology is where oncology was 30 to 40 years ago. And so we have a long way to go. So this is an example of a child that would commonly come to me. Oh, we love the when you stop love when they cut me. Uh, huh? So this is, you know, as a parent, you watch a child like this and, you know, it's very uncommon to get a video of something like this happening. So you have to explain to the doctor what happened and the kind of words you might use are, my child stopped and stared. And the first thing I can tell you that comes to the doctor's mind is that maybe your kid has ADHD, right? Um, and so oh, um, what we do know is that um, he has some sort of process going on that's causing this um, and it, that it can take a long time, given what the family has to work with, um, to get a diagnosis and the right treatment in place. Um, and this is during, obviously, a very critical time in a child's development. 
And this is just one example of how we put the burden of reporting, uh, both for diagnosis and monitoring on families. And it doesn't just affect children, it affects hundreds of millions of people um, in the US and throughout the world. And in the US, the problem's even more acute because we only have 20,000 neurologists and child neurologists. And the wait time um, to see a child neurologist can be over nine months. In Colorado, for example, it's about a year. So you can imagine the kind of suffering and challenges that families go through waiting to get answers, at least once they're in the queue, forget you know, the time it takes to get in line. So what we've developed is a platform for diagnosing and monitoring brain disorders by any clinician anywhere. And what that means is that first time you show up to the pediatrician's office, instead of waiting nine months to see the neurologist, they effectively have a neurologist in their pocket using a smartphone. And so our first product is FDA registered. It's on the market. It's a tool to diagnose actually the type of seizures that little boy had. It can be used by the office staff to free up time of the physician. Um, the way it works is the team logs in, enters the patient information, um, and then we'll confirm it and start a recording. Um, so start recording, yes. Um, the, the child's face is positioned such that it's basically a good selfie video. There is a one minute Popeye video at the beginning. Kids have never seen Popeye. They find this like hilarious. It's really strange. Um, then there's a three, two, one countdown. And the child is taught to exhale with the purple cloud. So as they exhale, they're actually blowing off carbon dioxide. It changes the pH in their blood. And if you have this type of epilepsy, it provokes a seizure more than 90% of the time. And the seizure consists of what you saw before, which is just stopping and staring. After the it's hyperventilation is over, there's another one minute Popeye video. Um, and then the data is uploaded to the cloud. So the important parts is that um, it, if the test is positive, the neurologists who accept the patients have agreed to see them in less than two weeks. So that cuts the wait time down by huge amounts. The physician who runs the test is reimbursed by insurance for running the test. So this isn't a consumer device. This is really a B2B sale um, that uh, allows clinics um, to get the best outcome for their patients. So we launched in June. We're currently in use in eight clinics and we just set up our first hospital, Children's of Alabama. So uh, we have um, a lot of happy physicians using it. Um, they report that the value proposition of cutting the wait time down is really real um, and that they're also able to make money on this, actually increasing um, a given visit by 50% reimbursement um, and then also allows them to manage their time better. So um, the way payment works is that this is uh, for a single procedure, the physician would bill a CPT code, which is basically a procedure code for performing the test. They pay eyes $50, of the total $85, for example, is Medicaid reimbursement in North Carolina. They add revenue of about $35 for that one patient practice on top of their regular visit coding, which typically reimburses about $70. So they're doubling their um, about 50% increase over the regular reimbursement. When you take that to a clinic level or for pediatricians, they do on average 350 tests a year. Um, eyes would make about 17000 and the practice would make an additional $12,000. And when you look at enterprise sales, which are hospital systems, they typically have around 20 clinics, um, and those numbers start to grow significantly. So we see a large market opportunity, particularly in the B&B space. Um, and this is really based on guidelines put out by the American Academy of Pediatrics, saying you need to screen children, even if they parents aren't reporting symptoms, um, to identify kids who may be having seizures, mood disorders, attention disorders. Um, and some of you may have, when you've taken your children to the pediatrician, you fill out these like four pages of questionnaires that nobody ever seems to look at. What we've basically developed is an objective, interactive, gamified method of um, doing this type of screening. So we currently have an NIH grant from, um, that's uh, going to Cincinnati Children's being run by EYES which is directly comparing the output of our app to the output of video EEG, which is considered the gold standard, um, and uh, being read by two separate groups of physicians and our sensitivity and specificity. Our sensitivity is 100% and our specificity is 92%. And uh, so that's gonna be presented at the American Epilepsy Society meeting 
uh, this coming month. So we've launched our first product. We have um, a large market expansion headed uh, as we develop further products, um, specifically in the attention space, the mood screening space, and then moving from the physician's office to the home environment. And what um, part of what's allowing to, us to do this is that on the back end, we're building a large, unique data set that we're protecting as a trade secret that we can then use to train our AI models on. Um, in terms of um, really, uh, there is not, there is, there is competition, but most of the competition requires significant equipment um, or is targeted to a specific position group um, or is subjective assessments. And so we really see that we stand alone. As I mentioned, we have a diverse IP portfolio with both patents as well as trade secrets, uh, creating a high barrier to entry. Um, in terms of our traction, uh, we are FDA authorized. We've been selling since June. Um, and as I mentioned, uh, we have um, uh, six clinics as well as a, a new uh, hot enterprise system. Um, we've been able to validate reimbursement, have clear guidelines in place from the American Academy of Pediatrics on use of our technology. Um, and our largest investor to date is UCB Pharma, um, who's also functioning as a channel partner. In terms of exit, we really see um, a that once we built up to at least 50 million ARR, that there will be clear uh, values um, for uh, merger and acquisition, or we continue to grow um, towards IPO. I'm gonna skip this. Um, we are planning on starting a 4 million round in January. Um, we see, as I mentioned, a large market opportunity, um, and our goal really is to achieve 20 million ARR with that um, and our second product release. That's it. Wow. Thank you so much. Um, wrapping us up with a great pitch, super detailed, uh, super technical. I feel like a lot of it's over my head uh, because I'm not obviously in this space, but clearly there's such a need for this within this market. Um, I really appreciate, and this is like a note to most founders, that you are going out and pitching and building these relationships with venture funds before your rounds even open. I think that's a really important and great note for a, a lot of us. Um, and most founders don't start early enough. So I really appreciate that you've started so very early. Um, you have such great traction since June, but most of these hospital systems are really long leads in terms of conversion. How did you, how did that happen? That's really impressive. Um, so currently our, all our sales are founder led sales. So my co-founder Parth and I, um, we have large networks, um, and, uh, we're really leaning in on our advisors, um, and honestly the data, um, and the need, and we're focusing on, we spent a lot of time really identifying who our target customer is. Our target customer, um, is mostly in the Southeast and kind of central regions, um, really places where there's like only one game in town, for example, like Alabama being an excellent example, they only have one child neurology center for the entire state and a really long wait time. Colorado, same story. They have only one group of child neurologists, effectively long wait times. And so the value proposition resonates with both the neurologists and the pediatricians. Um, and the neurologist is more than happy to say, listen, if you run the test and it's positive, I'll see them right away. But if you run the test and it's negative, don't send them um, because then we can see the patients you really need us to see. And that message just seems to work. And they're really going back to their referral network and introducing us. Awesome. Um, can you unshare your screen, please, so we can look at your face? Of course. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions from the audience? I know it's uh, late in the day. Oh, great. Morgan, go ahead. Ask your question. Um, so it really resonated with me as a parent who um, is exploring our own um, neurodivergent journey with our son. When you talked about how, you know, in that video, looking at those um, gestures, how how quickly some of the pediatricians would go like, oh, that looks more like ADHD. What? And that just seems to be a trend I'm hearing over and over, whether it's speech delays, autism, you know, different things that the pediatricians are like, it's a phase, they'll go through it, like eventually this will be a different diagnosis. What are you guys doing to help with that, like upfront education so that this even gets in front of the children? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, you're right. That's one of the barriers that we deal with is that um, there is a bit of an overconfidence amongst physicians as to their diagnostic accuracy 
Um, and so the what we found um, the best way to do it is to have the neurologist advocate to their group because they really do listen to the neurologist. The second is really to get um, to point out the American Academy of Pediatric Guidelines. They were published in 2019. It very clearly states ADHD is a diagnosis of exclusion. You have to exclude other etiologies. The second thing it states is that if you're making a diagnosis of ADHD, you need to look for comorbid conditions. Autism is on that list, as is absence epilepsy. And then the final uh, recommendation from the AAP is that um, if they're failing treatment for ADHD, you need to go back and make sure you're not missing something. And so kind of just saying, hey, look, this is what the AAP says. I know you think that your history is sufficient, but just remember your history is completely reliant on the parent. Um, and a parent can only do so much, right? I mean, they're not physicians. They, they don't have video typically to show you of how the child's behaving. And that does resonate. Um, but, you know, there is a, there's a curve, right? There's the early adopters that are, are going to go and proselytize. And ultimately, it's going to be the lateral sales that are going to make a big difference in terms of education. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, just as a note in terms of messaging and how this was presented, I had my aha moment as you were pitching, because again, this is super technical and super deep in the medical um, category. The gamification piece resonated really immediately with me. I would love to see that earlier in the conversation, because I think for a non-technical founder, consumer, investor, that piece was like an aha moment because there are so many companies out there that do similar things. Um, that really made a lot of sense. As soon as you said that, I was like, oh, I understand what this process really looks like. So just a note on that one. Um, you said you were FDA, you were waiting, awaiting FDA approval. What does the timeline look like on that? We are FDA registered. So registered. So that yeah, is a different classification. So we're a class one device. Um, and then our AI algorithm is going to, we will need to go back to the FDA. It's going to be a separate FDA approval process for that. Got it. Uh, much like the other, some of the other founders, I really appreciated you having a clear roadmap to exit um, and that 100 million mark. That's obviously what we want to see. Um, and I also really appreciate your roadmap to your other products, right? And that you're clearly focused on this current uh, current product, but that you understand the application of the technology in other needed areas. Um, how did you decide on those other categories? Was that part of the current research that you did or did that, is that just naturally the next step based on these current condition issues? Um, so it is based on the research, but then there's a second factor, which is this thing we hear from families and pediatricians over and over again, which is kids present with very, or people present with very nonspecific symptoms. Um, and it's very hard to tease apart what's what. Is this anxiety? Is this ADHD? And so to be able to have a single platform to tease apart these nonspecific symptoms is really what the customers are telling us they want. That's the poll. Got it. Um, those are all the questions that I have. Does anyone else in the room have any questions? Otherwise, I know we're, oh, Ariana, go for it. Um, so I know that you said that you're very focused in rural areas and that makes total sense, especially now. Um, but is there any roadmap to eventually expand to more urban areas where while there are many doctors, the wait times are still a year and 18 months long? I would, I, I was on a wait list for 18 months to get my son seen by a child development specialist. So I would love to kind of hear if you have that trajectory. Yes, absolutely. We're talking to NYU, for example, but the sales cycle is just really long. You know, that's kind of the challenge is getting through that sales cycle um, for these enterprise systems. Awesome. Thank you for that, Rachel. Any other final questions before we wrap up for today? I have just a quick one and I'm sorry, it's Julie again, but how, so I know you're doing it for autistic, you know, autistic because I have an autistic nephew who's 28, but when my mom recently had aortic aneurysm surgery, they thought maybe she had a stroke now. They, and then they called me to ask what medication she was on right there in the hospital. So what about Alzheimer's or strokes or have you looked at, at other diagnosis besides, um, children? Yeah, that's a great question. So my focus has been on disorders where we have a treatment that early intervention is going to alter. So I think there will be a time and a space for Alzheimer's treatment, and hopefully that will be the case soon. But at the moment, 
um, knowing you have it earlier, you can make lifestyle changes, but there's not necessarily specific treatments. And so I think that really hinders adoption in the medical space. Um, you need to really show that I make the diagnosis early, I change the trajectory of this child's life, and this is the clear benefit. Um, and that's really what we're going for. Awesome. Thank you so much.